But if you haven't got a boxing board of control that can deal with the BS that went on with the Conor Ben fight and deal with the Eddie Hearns and put these people into their places, whether it's yeah. Callis Island or Eddie Hearn or Frank Warren or Ben Shalom, yeah. and make them control properly what happens with fights, because promoters are the leading influence in boxing now. Sure. They're the ones that make the fights. They're the ones that control the direction of travel. And that feels like, to me, like the tail wagging the dog. Welcome to another edition of Talk Boxing with Simon Jordan and the inimitable Spencer Oliver. Award-winning Talk Boxing is where I think it will be, Spence. How are you, mate? You okay? I'm all good, Simon. Yourself? Yep, not so bad, not so bad. Um, listen, let's get straight into it. As, we, as everyone knows from the previous shows, we have a format for this particular environment, which is three subjects that we like to get into and have a deep dive into them. Um, we tend to spitball and move off in different directions and take it in different spaces and places. And then we go to a section of the show which is uh, where uh, audience engagement comes into play and we answer three questions about mm -hmm. subject matters that might be from the past, in the present, and things that are hot topics. So let's go straight in, Spence. Anthony Joshua. And what's happening with him, where he's going, what we know about his current plight or mindset or state of uh, play. But also, this week specifically, there seems to be some developments about who he's going to work with. Yeah. And the rumour doing the rounds, and I don't know how much of a rumour it is, but it's coming from the mouth of one of the particular protagonists, sure. is that he may land upon Roy Jones Jr. as a mm -hmm. trainer. Now, you and know Anthony pretty well. Yeah. And we've debated about the challenges that he's had over the last couple of years with training methodologies not understanding fight plans for whether it was going in against the first fight against Usyk with Rob McCracken, who mm -hmm. I think we both recognise as a great trainer, and we yeah. can't perhaps understand why that didn't seem to go the way you would have thought it done. Mm. Then he's moved into Robert Garcia um, and Angel Fernandez for the rematch against Usyk, better. And now we're talking about Roy Jones Jr., who's yeah. obviously working, has been working with Chris Eubank Jr. What's your take on that? Look, I think where Anthony Joshua's at in his career at the moment is he's trying to find he's trying to find a trainer. He's trying to he's trying to find those improvements that's needed, those adjustments that's needed um, to go on and try and recapture this world heavyweight title. So, for for Joshua's Joshua's point of view, he sees it as he wants to go around and he's like a sponge, Joshua, where he likes to work with different people, take on board different things. I think that he recognised what jo uh, Roy Jones Jr. had done with Chris Eubank Jr. and the improvements he made and the adjustments. And we all know J uh, Roy Jones's history, his background sure. and how good he was technically, you know, the greatest fighter of mod when you our say modern era. When you say adjustments, Spence, yeah. I mean, I think you and I have discussed this and kicked this around a number of times. Mm. Isn't the major adjustment the mindset yeah. in terms of this ability yes. to step on it and 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 to go back to what he was? I, I um, allude to the fact, and you can correct me if you feel so um, privy to do so, um, that it kind of changed from the knockdowns against Klitschko, where some of the feeling about mm -hmm. what it took to win fights. Yeah, and and I, I, I choose my words, word, uh, you know, uh, carefully because people will say, well, if you haven't laced up a glove, then you shouldn't say that sort of things. But I've got to be blunt about it. I, I think he went into a different mode after yep. getting into that fight with Klitschko, which was a dark place to be. So we're talking about the adjustment. Really, is I know it's the yep. expression that Adam Catterall uses, which is well rehearsed and probably a little bit sentimental, which is the eye of the tiger. Yeah. Is that the adjustment that you're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. Listen, uh, to to um, back up what you're saying there, with the, the psychological side of things that we're talking about here with Anthony Joshua, not the physical side of things, because I think you're right in what you say. The psychological damage was done from Kalichko, I think, that first heavy knockdown from Kalichko. Going into a dark to, place to have to win. Yeah, it yeah. went into a dark place. And then obviously Andy Ruiz Jr. knocked him out. And so... There is psychological damage there, and that's what Anthony Joshua needs to f he re needs to rediscover that rawness that took him to the world heavyweight title. Basically, I mean, and it's easier really said out, than did done. I mean, Ruiz didn't really knock him out. Anthony sort of stepped back and didn't seem. Yeah, to but go I, on, did I he? think it was a, it was from after the third round when he'd had Ruiz on the floor, and then out of Ruiz nowhere, Ruiz hit him without yeah. a hook and put him down, yeah. and then he slowly, systematically broke him down for a few rounds, didn't he? Until Joshua was forced into submission. But 
and then it manifests itself in the Usyk fight. That's a hard thing to correct, you know, the, 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 well, the, the mind, the psychological yeah. damage, because we could sit here, right, when it's been done, speaking as an ex-fighter as well, and I do really understand this, when that damage has been done, Joshua can be sitting there going, right, I know what I've got to do, I've got yeah. to take this fight to you, but when it... When reality kicks in, when the, that's, muck, when the muck and bullets are flying, when you're absolutely. in a it, yeah, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the, the Mike know? Tyson fame adage: yeah. you've got a plan until they get a punch yeah. in the face. But you know, so I think it's the confidence maybe he's looking for. With like, so Joshua's one of those guys that likes support and feel like he's got the right people around him. So what I'm saying is, Roy Jones Jr. and his history and everything else might give Joshua the added confidence he needs to try and rediscover that psychological damage that's clearly been done. Do you do you like this for? Isn't it better for a fighter to have a stable and well-drilled regime around him rather than sort of bouncing around between trainers trying to find this missing yeah. component? Yeah. That, do you think he closed the gap mentally in the second fight against Usyk? Because I cannot, for what it's worth, get an explanation, I don't know if you've ever been able to find one, of what the thinking was in the first fight against Usyk, because it was everything that Anthony Joshua shouldn't have done, yeah. was the things that he did. We've heard tales, and I'm not going to breach any confidences, but leading trainers being in uh, a particular corner and 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 wrapping up a fighter, and Anthony Joshua being hours away from his fight, yeah. asking that trainer, "What would you do in yeah. this fight?" Yeah. Which which I can't believe that a, a guy that's fought X amount of you know heavyweight mm. championship fights and is a world heavyweight champion is sitting there talking yeah. to another trainer, you know, literally mm. 60, 70 minutes before he's due to go into a yeah. ring. Question that does that what does that tell you about Anthony's mindset? It tells you that he's not confident in the in the people that he's got around him. Maybe he feels like there's something missing, and that's why he's on the road and he's looking for different trainers and he's looking for people to add to what he's got because. There, there was if, if he feels like there's something missing, when you're going into it's like the ultimate gladiatorial sport, you need to feel like you've left no stone unturned. You've got everything, you've got the confidence of your team behind you because you put your life in the hands of a trainer. He makes those decisions, right? For, from a fighter's point of view, like if the fighter's clearly not fit and able enough to come out for this, just use a round for an example, like round nine, and the trainer says, how are you feeling? You ready? The fighter will always go, yeah, it's, it's a fighter's intuition. It's, that's how he thinks. Yeah. But the trainer has to make that decision and go, no, you're not all right, son. I'm going to pull you out or whatever. So you need to have that that confidence of the trainer. You're putting your life in the hands of a trainer. So, so I think that if he feels that there's something missing from the training side of things, from the training team, perhaps that's the psychological damage that he's got. He's got to feel that he's got 100 p- sense support around him and I think that's what he might be missing he might be feel that there's a missing element to this team do you think he was right I mean we, we can we've, we're sort of dancing around the flames of whether Anthony Joshua is now gun shy mm-hmm. that's the accusation yeah. isn't it I mean I got the impression that he was uh, I don't want to use the word braver but I can't think of a better word at this moment in time because it takes an inordinate amount of bravery <laughs> just to step through the bloody rings yeah yeah uh, through the rope sorry um, but do you think he closed the gap mentally in being able to try to do what he needed to do with Usyk yeah. and started to bridge that gap mentally of what he once was which was a wrecking machine that stood, saw people in front of them, him as an opportunity to knock mm. him out yeah. to somebody that started to negotiate his way through fights yeah. and try to find a way to get himself in and out of fights without the maximum amount of jeopardy involved. Did you see that gap being bridged with the Usyk fight in the second one where I, I thought he was much better and sat down his punches much mm. much more than he did in the first fight? What was your takeaway from it? 100%. You know, Besides we your snivelling, grovelling little uh, pep talk <laughs> that you gave him afterwards. No, right? yeah, we'll, we'll get into that as well. Um, but, look, I think he uh, bridged the gap massively from the first fight to the second fight. And I think he would do the same again. We've had that conversation, yeah. haven't we? We said we think he'd do even even better in, in the third fight. And that tells you the confidence. Like, he went in there, and I don't think he believed in himself with the first Usyk fight. After the first couple of rounds, he thought, I'm in with a world-class operator here who actually can take my power. And if that's the case, then he saw... So he was very negative in that first fight, way too negative, and allowed Usyk to control it, controlled the space yeah. and controlled the whole contest. Second fight, he rolled the dice a little bit more, which he had to do, which he had, which, to, which he had, which to, he had to do. And we all talked about it and we say, look, it's easy to go in there and get reckless. It's heavyweight boxing. You go in there, get reckless, get hit, get hurt, and fight's over. And I think that's where the damage has been done to Joshua now, where he knows he can be hurt. 
He does. He holds back just a little bit. But we did see more of it in that second fight. And I think that added confidence to him, really, because I think that he... That outburst that he done at the end of the fight was, and this is a game just one saying, wasn't it? It wasn't, yeah, not just frustration, but I believe the team around him are saying, you've won that. Yeah. You've won that. And like, you know, he's gone through a hard 12 rounds. There's slight concussion there. You can clearly see by his actions afterwards. He's going in the ring, out the ring. Who never let, he should, someone should have taken control of that situation. And I think his actions after that was because he was being told something that was not actually true. Like, yes, and I said it to him, in that interview afterwards, after nine rounds, that fight was all even, but Usyk run away with it. He used mm. his better, bu better boxing skills. And Josh was, you know, told me this himself. He said, like, the speed of the guy in the last few rounds, he just took it to another level yeah. and Joshua couldn't compete with that. Yeah. You know? What do you, um, what do you think then for Roy Jones Jr.? Is it the right move? Because we debated uh, on other shows about Anthony not going over to America to train with Garcia, yeah. dragging him here. Yeah. Right? So he's in his little comfort zone. Yeah. And he needs to probably go back to basics. I'm not suggesting he goes up into Russian woods like Rocky did. Yeah. But I'm talking about getting back to the basics of what he needs to do to get this mental edge back into, mm. his, into his game. Do you think Roy Jones Jr., because we had some questions about Chris Eubank coming out and falling in between two stalls, didn't they? whether it was Arthur or Martha when he first fought for Roy Jones Jr., which was yeah. starting to look like, trying to look like well, Roy he, Jones. He, 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 he didn't know if it was Chris Eubank Sr. or Roy Jones. Yeah. That was the difference. Yeah. Like he, was right, he didn't know if he was trying to box like his dad. He was caught between stalls, wasn't he, between his dad yeah. and Roy Jones Jr., and, and it didn't work. You know, it, that, that didn't work, and that is a concern. So do you think Roy Jones Jr. is, for want of a better expression, Flash for cash name around Joshua that sounds good on paper yeah. but might actually add no value. Or do you think it's a smart move? And is he going to fall down into a training camp that also mm. has Robert Garcia in there? Aren't yeah. you going to have a lot of cooks and, you know... Yeah, Angel enough? Fernandez and Robert Garcia and, like... Yeah, too many cooks and all that, you know. And I think that, that is a, that's another problem that Anthony Joshua's got, that he needs to find this one guy... You know, not like, even it, two different like two, two different trainers are gonna have two different views and everything else. Roy Jones Jr. Stylistically, is he right for Anthony yeah. Joshua? One hundred percent, I would say no. Stylistically, if he it's tries insane. to install that in Anthony yeah. Joshua, we've got big problems. You know, if Joshua starts trying to come out of his hands down, using his reflexes, yeah. going That's speed, hands, going, yeah. we got problems. Garcia sort of did fit that bill because he's sort of like you know he he works more on aggression and stuff. Um, but yeah, it's just but interestingly, it's not, never never trained anyone of note in the heavyweight no, division. But I think that with training with Roy Jones Jr., I don't think that would be more working on the, you know the style. I think that Roy Jones Jr. maybe work more on his mindset, mindset yeah. the, the, the psychological. So side. that's you, what's damaged. Not are the you, style. Are you um, are you are you are you positive for it, or do you think yeah, where are you going with this? Yeah, I, I, six one half a dozen the other. I'm 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 caught between it. Yeah. Like I'm thinking, right. Hopefully this works. Right. You know, hopefully this have works. You, have you, have sure you, have you, have you, have you seen a fence that you're not, that you've not been prepared to sit on recently? <laughs> what are you saying? I've got splinters. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So next 12 months for <laughs> AJ, given the fact we think that he's likely to fight Dillian White. Yeah. We don't know what Dillian White has got left. I just imagine he's got plenty left. I also think that's a dangerous fight for AJ. Well, well of course it is. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask you, because mm. that's a fight where Dillian will come to fight, won't he? So Absolutely. he's going to have to get involved with Anthony. And they've got history. And they've got history. And, and, that's, and that plays a big part of games, do you know what I mean? Like, Joshua knows he can get hurt by Dillian. Like, I've seen that he got hurt as an amateur yeah, got, and, and, yeah. and in that in the fight. Yeah, absolutely. Fight, didn't he? So... Yeah. I get, that's a dangerous fight, you know. I, I know we're talking about what route is Anthony Joshua going to go down, what paths he going to go down. You go, but that's when we were talking about the Fury fight. But I I'm think going. I think he's right. I mean, despite the fact that I find Eddie Hearn and his little gang slightly tiresome with their nonsense, they they are right in this instance to have perhaps mm. obfuscated around this fight yeah. because it would have been. I think it was a. Whilst it was a huge opportunity for Anthony, and we've spoken about it before, I think it's the wrong opportunity yeah. for him because he needs to rebuild. And Fury knew it was the wrong opportunity. That's why he, he made it a 60-40 split, yeah. took away the perhaps contentious points. But 60-40 of a much mm. bigger purse with Anthony Joshua involved than someone else. Yeah. So really he wasn't giving up that much. So I think uh, you know Eddie Hearn and his gang were right to perhaps influence Anthony Joshua if that's what they've done. Yeah. Uh, 258 to perhaps yeah. pull back, regroup. You don't take on your enemy when they're stronger. You take on your enemy when you're yeah, at your sure, strongest, right? Sure, and he's sure. not at his strongest mentally. And I think it's absolutely right. I think Dillian White is a fight that has resonance. It's sellable. Mm. It's marketable. It's credible. Um, and both of them will come to win, I yeah. suspect. And it's just a case of, do we see Anthony Joshua back to his blasting best? 
which we saw when he fought Dillian White first time mm. round because Dillian yeah. White straightened him, livened him up. Yeah, uh, second and round. And ultimately yeah, yeah. gassed a little bit, didn't he, yeah. Dillian, and got, got pinged by Anthony. But I think that's a good fight. But can you see beyond that? Can you see the landscape beyond that? Do you think there's any possibility that he arrives with Deontay Wilder before he gets anywhere near a world title shot? Or do you think if he beats Dillian White, he gets an opportunity to fight the winner of... Uh, Fury Usyk, is that what you think? Because we've got Frank yeah. in the background telling us that's not going to happen. No. Because we've got Joe Joyce, yeah, next cab off the yeah, rank sure. for the world title shot in the summer. And, and you've, you know, you've got guys like Philip Her Philip Hergovic, who's now the IBF mandatory contender. So now he's named in the frame, and I think that the Sourlands are trying to push for him. So the titles may get fragmented, and so the titles go all over the place. And by default, Joshua could fight for a vacant title somewhere, or whatever. But the way that I see it right now is. I see a fight with Deontay Wilder and Anthony Joshua much more likely than Anthony Joshua versus Tyson Fury anytime in the near future. Anthony Joshua versus Usyk again. I think Joshua will go Dillian White. Then we could possibly see Joshua Wilder. I think that's, that's, that, I think that's the great. Uh, I think that's the the roadmap that I see. If it's I'm a honest, great fight. Yeah, I mean, people are talking. There's another discussion off piste about Hergovic having to have a shot at the IBF, but doesn't undisputed. It. Because obviously you've got Tyson fighting Chisora, right? Yeah. The next fight off the off the, out there is supposed to be the the undisputed fight. That will trump. Doesn't well, undisputed. We won't. We won't. We won't get the undisputed. You know. You know. Like doesn't undisputed trump mandatory. Yeah. It does. Oh, it? absolutely. So yeah. what will happen is if the titles do get fragmented and they say right, because um, like so we've got this Tyson Fury. Alexander Usyk fight coming up, let's say March. We're talking about March right. sort of time. That That's for the about. undisputed. Yeah, for the, yeah, yeah, but it won't be for the undisputed because the because Philip Philip Herbovich is now the IBF mandatory, and the Sourlands are pushing for him but to I get thought, the shot but first. But I thought, I thought, and correct me if if, if I'm wrong. I thought that the a an undisputed fight for all the belts trumped a mandatory, which yeah. means that all the belts go in as we know, for an undisputed, yeah. and one of them comes out with all the belts. Yeah. You're saying that, no, before you get to that stage, yeah, because the of, IBF will because, one off. Because, the, yeah, the IBF are basically mandating Hergovic. So now the Sourlands are putting pressure on them to say, well, we want Hergovic versus Usyk. So let him put all the belts on the line without, obviously, the WBC, but let him put all these belts on the line against um, Hergovic before yeah. this Fury fight happens. But if he decides not to do that, he says, no, we want a unified world title fight anyway against the number one, number two heavyweights in the world. We'll let that IBF go. IBF goes, Philip Hergovic then goes and boxes, I don't know, whoever, Anthony Joshua, whoever it may yeah. be, for the IBF. And then getting them titles back together again is very difficult. So that's where we're at in a moment. Again, the heavyweight... You know, the heavyweight scene at the, at the moment, the landscape of the heavyweight scene, just changing all the time. I'm not sure we're going to get this undisputed fight, if I'm honest. Mm, I mean, because the Saudis want undisputed. Absolutely. So, again, I, I thought I thought the undisputed trumped mandatory, but it'll play out. No. I mean, I spoke to one yeah. of the big guy, one of the big promoters that assured me that if you've got a mandatory mm. opportunity and you've got an opportunity for the undisputed then all the belts come together yeah. in an undisputed fight and there and afterwards that's, the mandatory steps that's in. where yeah that's where we are at at the moment but because of this IBF sanctioning um, or, or mandating Philip Her Hergovic mm -hmm. as their champion now the Sourlands are yeah, putting why, pressure but, 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 but on but why so, wouldn't the WBO do the same then and the WBC do the same why wouldn't all the divisions say, well, it's I'm all about timings you. because you. because you get like so when you become champion of that belt you get I don't know what it is 9 months time, or 12, yeah. 12 yeah. months I think it is um, for that, so it's all about timings and when the ma mandatories are due up, and that's what it is about. Like, like, so um, well, let's use um, Josh Taylor as an example. Josh Taylor ended up having to give all these belts up because he couldn't fulfill all these mandatories. Yeah, yeah. Do, do you know what I'm timings, saying? Yeah. So he had to let yeah. the WBC go to the right, IBF. Well, we will see. I mean, yeah. either which way, it makes an interesting landscape because you've got all these moving parts. You've got Anthony Joshua and mm. his potential future opportunities. You've got Fury versus Usyk, Fury versus Chisora. We've got Joe Joyce in the mix. Yeah. Sooner rather than later, we'll in the have mix. Daniel Dubois in the mix as well. Yeah. So it becomes a very interesting landscape. I think it, listen, I think we said this last year, to be fair, like, well, but I think the early part of the year, we're going to get big fights. We're going to get maybe Deontay Wilder versus Andy Ruiz Jr. And that's for the WBC final eliminator. You know, you're going to get Philip Hergovic against a big name. We know he's an exciting fighter. You know, we've got Anthony Joshua, you've got Dillian White, you've got Joe Joyce. So, yeah, th th there's going to be some big fights for sure, but undisputed, I'm not sure it's going to happen now. The British Boxing Board of Control. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's efficacy, and by that I mean, is it fit for purpose? Yeah. Are we yeah. in a situation now where this 
charitable organization that's got a charitable status yeah is any, is now becoming a scenario where its lack of effectivity in very challenging times whether it's poor refereeing decisions that seem to put fighters like Bradley mm. Skeet into circumstances they perhaps shouldn't be yeah. in um, whether it's you know scenarios surrounding um, fighters failing drug tests Mm-hmm. and ultimately the debacle that we had with yeah. Conor Bem and Chris Eubank Jr., or whether it's their overall governance of mm-hmm. refereeing decisions like Josh Taylor versus Jack Cattrall. Yeah. So my view, and from my Dime Store tour, once upon a time you had Leonard Nipper-Reed running the British Boxing yes, Board of Control. Right? So yeah. this was a guy that caught yeah. all the best villains in this country. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Whether it was the craze or whether it was the great yeah. train robbers. And he ran it in a way that seemed to be very close to the promoters, had a strong control mm-hmm. over what they did and didn't do. And why I'm mentioning the promoters in this is I'm not sure that the British Boxing Board of Control, albeit their only funding model, is by the nature of licensing fees yeah, sure. and promoter contributions to their overall uh, business model, you know, they, what do they bring in a million and a half a year on average, mm. make a couple of hundred grand out of it, pay the salaries of people like Robert Smith, mm-hmm. and seem to sit there with no legislative power. Yes, yeah. they sanction the fights, and yes, they can turn around and say we're not going to. But when it comes down to it, yeah, there seems to be an inordinate amount of influence that people have over them that seems to control, is my perception, what the boxing British Boxing Board of Control mm-hmm. and it's it, will, will and won't do, how they will and won't do it, and how yeah. much teeth they have. I think it's their lack of commitment to um, it's their lack of commitment to put pressure on promoters for certain divisions, um, certain decisions. Sorry, um, their lack of commitment. They yeah to push anything, and I think that's where we that's what that, that's where we come. But they don't seem right to have, now. They don't seem to, to make any decisions. Their lack of commitment to make decisions. We don't seem to have any teeth. Now, I'm not suggesting that you want a government involved, but you do want some form of proper dialed-in jurisdiction. Mm. And you're going to always have this compromise if the finances of the way that the board are supported economically is by the bigger promoters Mm. paying the biggest amount of licensing fees and perhaps having a certain amount of undue influence. And the only way you're going to correct that is change Mm. the jurisdiction. Because this this sport... Alongside Do you think it can be changed, though? That's well, what I'm well, saying. Well, of course, because of, of, course, what, what, you well, know. of course it can, right? But the fact is you've got to have a will to do it first and foremost. It can't, yeah. be, it can't be jobs for the boys. It can't be a nice, comfortable environment where everybody mm. gets on all the time. And subsequently, when it comes to strong, strong decisions that need to be made, then you sort of you, you, you camp together in a certain mentality. But you in know. that transition, where would you see boxing? Like, where, you know, where, where would boxing be in that transition? Because... You know, it's easy us speaking about that, and we we know that we do need change because of the recent decisions that have been made. Well, the boxing board of control are not applying enough pressure on certain promoters, etc., or, or they're not making any decisions. So, yeah, you're right, Simon. Things do need to change, need to change big time. But that transition in change, how do we how do we make that? You know, how do we you know how is that done? But it's, there also has to be a, mature, there's a variety of ways that it's done by the very nature of the Boxing Board of Control, having the balls to look at the situation and mm. go, well, hang yes. on a second, you know, we need to get hold of this situation, we need to have more legislative powers, we need to have better control over the direction of travel, we need to be more meaningful in our evolution of how refereeing standards in this country step up to make mm. much more consistency so we eliminate some of the scenarios that cause great concern about the integrity of the sport. You can't get around everything. You look at football, football's yeah. got more money than God, right? But it's got mm. it's got refereeing decisions being made by VAR that everybody is screaming at and everyone's criticising and questioning the veracity of the systems in place. So we know you can't square yeah. a circle perfectly, but there has to be a better outcome because boxing, for some example, for, for, you know, for some in recent s- years, has, has got far worse with the decisions that are being made. That's for sure. For less, I'm just using myself as an example. When I was boxing in the late nineties, and you move forward now, we're, we've gone forward twenty odd years, and the, and you know the results that we're seeing weekly, really, we're seeing a lot of bad decisions weekly. Where you're going, how have you come up with that decision? Or it's poor refereeing things, or well, I think it, I things think it outside lacks, of that. I think it lacks professionalism. It, yeah, it, that's it lacks, the word. It lacks, that's it, exactly it. Lacks it. a forward thinking mo- motivation. And it, it lacks this sort of, uh, I don't want to say integrity because that's unfair, but it's like, for example, Robert Smith comes up to me in the uh, uh, Clarissa Shields, yeah. um, Savannah Marshall fight, and says, yeah, like you what you have to say, but you don't know everything. 
I yeah. said, but I didn't think I did, Robert. But the fact is that I'm filling a vacuum that neither you or anyone else will fill. The Bo British Boxing Board of That's Control it. should be front and centre. They should be leading the sport. Mm. They should be saying, we're not having this, we're not having that. They should be closing every single loop and removing any instances of people being uh, you know, concerned about mm. how they're operating and why they're operating in the way that they do. And you look at it and say... Legislation now, boxing is getting away with things. Basically. But how can he say you don't know everything and then you won't eat? eat what you don't want, no, because we've said, come on the show, and, and tell I'll, us everything, and stop hiding behind the legalese of things yeah. because you're in a position where you are the ultimate authority. But but go back to the point I was just about to make. And one of the things that really can, worries me, Spence, if we don't get this lack of, we don't get this professional in the sport to a level, high level of intensity. I'm watching around other sports. The, the narrative being built up, rightly so, about things like concussion protocols and dementia yeah. and all the challenges that are going on there. And eventually, this is going to properly land in the back garden of boxing. You already know there's a huge lobby out there that yeah. thinks this is a brutal sport, that thinks it should be outlawed, and are pushing for boxing to be changed or even to put in a situation where people can deny its right to exist. Yeah. And if you don't have an effective leading governing body that takes things forward in a way that advances the sport, eventually things like dementia protocols and concussion scenarios are going to land in boxing's back garden without any remedy, any solution. Because what I see from my sort of pseudo-intelligent outlook towards boxing yeah. and my commercial mind is, if you haven't got a proper governing body that leads things forward, these challenges, and I'm not suggesting that boxing should just say, well, we, we, we get a bit of shtick, right, and we find our way to sort of navigate around the idea yeah. that we've got to deal with health issues. But if you haven't got a boxing board of control that can deal with the BS that went on with the Conor Ben fight and deal with the Eddie Hearns and put these people into their places, whether it's yeah. Callis Island or Eddie Hearn or Frank Warren or Ben Shalom, yeah. and make them control properly what happens with fights, because promoters are the leading influence in boxing now. Sure. They're the ones that make the fights. They're the ones that control the direction of travel. And that feels like, to me, like the tail wagging the dog. Yeah. You know, you've got a fight where you've got leading promoters trying to put two guys in a ring with failed drug tests at the center of it, with yeah. catch weight fights being at the middle of it in terms of the jeopardy that goes with that. Yeah. And the boxing board of control, like I've said before, are, are, are like a eunuch. They seem yeah. to be going, hang on a second, yeah. we're getting pushed around here. Do we dare go up against this promoter? Because the argument is, and I heard Johnny Nelson talking about me the other day and having the balls to ask questions, because yeah. if you don't ask these questions, you're going to get sued. We can't be in a situation mm. where promoters are putting the fear of God into the British boxing board of control. Yeah. And that's why I think you've got yeah. to get... You've got to get it starts with proper leadership, yeah. and I'm not suggesting that Robert Smith isn't a good guy, but I think there's time for a change, somebody to get hold of it, drive it forward and say, right, this is not happening anymore. Mm -hmm. We're going to get better refereeing. We're going to standardise the quality of refereeing. We're going to have a policing mechanism to make sure the yeah. quality is out there. We're going to look at the manner in which we deal with such th controversial things like the licensing of fights that have challenges around them for failed drug tests because we're going to debate about whether a contract says UCAD or VAD or any mm. of that nonsense. And I just think it's leadership. Yeah. And it's leadership that's lacking and 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 it's and it's diminishing the role of the board. And I yeah. and I want the, the board board needs to get hold of it again and, yeah. and, and take, like you say, leadership. And I think that's been the big problem over over recent years, as we've seen that decisions are not being made. You know, so, you know, promoters are, are sort of controlling what goes on where it should be the like you say, the boxing board of control. They should have be the ones that have got hold of this, but they seem to have lost hold of it. And of course, you know, the situation surrounding the scenarios with I go back to the Conor Ben fight. I don't want to make it a, you know, a, a long drawn out process, yeah. but that's going to go away. Yeah. That's going to disappear into the ether. Yeah. No one's going to be accountable for anything. Yeah. And there's some people that need to be accountable and they can deflect if they want and they can make snide observations about people. Do you think that will go away though? Yeah. I, think I, mean, yeah, I, don't I do. Know. I, because there's no appetite for it not to. I know, I know it's gone very quiet, but because I'm not there's, sure. no, there's no appetite yeah, for, it, for it not to Maybe go right. away. And people need to be consequenced and not just a fighter. Because there mm. is a process there that should have been followed and there should have been some very strong intervention from the British Boxing Board of Control. Not just a wagging finger in the face of people like me at a fight because I dare ask questions. Yeah, It should sure. be the British Boxing Board of Control. We've got the teeth. We're going to bite you in the arse if you don't operate properly. Sure. Yeah. Anyway, we will see. If yeah. That, from that little epiphany yeah. of our views, if anything changes. I hope it changes. I hope it becomes a more formidable organisation because right now I, I do think it's a toothless tiger. Talking about toothless tigers, I don't know whether that's the right power, uh, power, you know, analogy, but I think it is, given the fact he doesn't seem to want to fight very much. Um, Tommy Fury and the weekend's events, the ongoing rumbling of something that makes my butt cheeks clench, which is the fight against Jack Paul. Yeah. All that goes in with Jake Paul, so all that goes in with that. Yeah. Um, 
walk me through what you saw over oh. the weekend from the Fury oh, family. On one hand, we've got right. Tyson Fury all nice and polished. Right, and so and Ross, and on the other hand, we've got his dad strips down to the yeah. waist, shouting at a ring. I mean, let's start with, let's go with the whole event. Because really, this is... I'm glad you asked me this question, Simon, because we've got to talk about Good, this. Good, I do try De- 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 Deji and Floyd Mayweather. Floyd Mayweather, the best boxer of modern times. You know, we can't argue with that. Getting in there, you know, at the ripe old age of 48 or whatever he is to take on these YouTube stars and everything. It is not boxing. I just want to say that. And Tommy Fury is starting to fall in that bracket. We're going to get into the Fury thing first, but I wanted to talk about the Mayweather thing. For me, it's not boxing. I think it's entertainment. The zone yep. have had to go down that route because um, they can't monetize boxing well. And so yet. I think that the, the, the mechanism doesn't work in the boxing. So they've got... they. You know, they're using KSI and they're using De- his brother Deji and he's using which, YouTube way, stars, which Jake Paul. Which, by the way, which is you fine. and I both accept there's a space yeah, it's for. it's fine, absolutely. But it's not top of the house. It's not top of the house. Right. And, and so where are we going? So the reason I've, I've said that is they're doing this entertainment thing out in um, Dubai and that, that's fine, that's great, mate. Whether people chance to see him, he's clowning around, wins in six rounds against Deji. And then we've got this, then we move into the... Um, Tommy Fury situation. So where does he want to be, Tommy? Does he want to be an influencer? Does he want to be a boxer? I don't think he's got the ap- I don't think he's got the appetite to be a boxer. I don't think the desires there. Uh, you know, I, I think he's, he he earns money. He earns a lot of money yeah. outside of boxing. Him and his girlfriend and that and that influencer world. And when you're earning that sort of money, I'm just questioning his desire yeah. and his love and his passion for the sport because. I mean, he missed the weight out there, right? He, he missed the weight by I mean, seven it, pounds or whatever. He maintains it was. that was he was able to do that, and he was, and and when he got off the st- got off the scales, they say he's made weight. And then the argument comes back, yeah, from well, the other fighter, which is hang on a second. Even by your logic, yeah, you still haven't made it. Even, yeah, if, even if even if you, even if you're got, still two pounds overweight. Still two pounds or whatever, or whatever, I don't yeah. understand why well, yeah. none of them seem to know what the fighting weight should have been. But so if he's not got that discipline, that makes me question well, his desire. Fighter? He's as had a, six fights, right? Uh, yeah, he's had six fights. So he gets in there, he does this exhibition out there, and, I mean, the whole thing was a disaster, if I'm yeah. totally honest. We had Jake Paul on comms. I don't know if anyone's heard it. If they haven't, go back on YouTube. He's swearing and doing right. whatever, and you think, this What's is a little, little bit, yeah, distasteful. It's not really great. Fury's in there doing this exhibition, and good luck to him. I don't know what money, sort of money he's getting paid, but it was an exhibition. It was like tit for tat, and they were clowning around and everything yeah. else. And I'd just go, look... Tommy, no one got you're second, a fury. No one got second gear you're a fury, and what's going on here is a little bit of a joke. Yep. You're saying you're a professional boxer. You know we got Tyson Fury, the best heavyweight around on, at, at the moment, and yeah. we got Huey Fury, exactly the same. And then you have got you, and you're saying you're a boxer, but you're not really a boxer. You're just getting this. And if you want to be there, that's fine. Be there. Like you know, that's not a problem. I haven't got. I ain't got issues with it. Like you and, and the entertainment side of things. That's fine. There's a, there is a place for that. But but it's leveraging the Fury but, name. But yeah, it's, it's leveraging a bait and switching. It's not really. Can, you've yeah, got the Fury name and all that goes with that. And then you've got. And then what is John? Contestant. What is John Fury doing? I mean, let's get into that. Like afterwards, taking his top off in the ring. Well, I mean, where does he fit into all this? Is, well, he's an enigma. Is he trying to take? Well, John Fury all the star, John, stardom away from you know from Tommy or from? Well, a, John Fury is an enigma wrapped up in a riddle, isn't he? Because he's one of these guys that you listen to and think when you when I listen to him on BT Sport, I think he is an outstanding observer yeah. of boxing. Well, he's a yeah, he's and a, he is and, and 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 such an engaging speaker. No muck about, straight yeah. to the point. He's and a whoever, great student of the game. And, and he knows the student. game. And then this other side of him, and when I, when I had a long chat with him uh, at Wembley before the um, the F- uh, Fury White fight, and when and Tyson came in to do an interview with myself and Jim and you as well um, mm. in the dressing room of the, uh, back in April, and John was such engaging company. Yeah. And then you've got this other side of him, which yeah. we know about backgrounds and so on and so forth. Yeah, They're yeah. fighting men, right? Yeah. These yeah. are not angels, uh, well, aren't they? Listen, we know you that. Know, we know, know that. that. Every, you know, every saint has a past and every <laughs> sinner has a future, right? So I get all that. Yeah, yeah. But, but the bottom line is, is that John seems to get involved in things. He got involved in an altercation when Dillian White came into the fight, into the press conference. Yeah, he did. And I, don't, I don't know whether he's a rebel rouser. It's all part of the routine. It's all part of the shit. Yeah, yeah, part of which the show. Which you get John yeah. Fury and you know you're going to get, yeah. you know, a bit of a jamboree. It's a bit P.T. Barnumish. Mm. I mean, but, I mean, what do you takes, make of he, it? He takes his top off, right? Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm cringing a little bit if I'm honest. I'm not going to lie. I'm, I'm actually, I want to crawl under the table right now because like, I'm just thinking. But he's done a bit of that though, isn't he? And he's, I can't he's been see what I saw. He did a foul took mouth. His top off. Foul mouth at Jake Paul. I'm going to yeah. do this. I'm going to do that. And there's no one in front of him. So he can get out the ring yeah. if he wants. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? He's like, oh, and he's looking for something to hold him back. And I'm just going, 
Is this just the part of the show or what? I mean, what is it? But, but you don't mind it. Like we saw, we saw, I, I mean, I was a bit cross with Tyson Fury and I told him so, which he didn't much like. And also Derek Chisora when they tried to steal the limelight from Joe Joyce and Joseph yeah. Parker after it was their fight. Yeah, they had yeah. been an absolute barn burner. And then these two Herberts outside the ring are making it all about them and John Fury got in the mix of that. Yeah. I, I don't mind that in terms of I didn't like the fact they deflected from the two guys that should be mm. getting all the credit and everyone was sort of standing there all Gareth A. Davis and all, all the boxing world like you know bees around a pot you know, sort of circulating around yeah. the two fighters that just put on this barn burner sort of sitting there going I know it was, oh, it was, it was, right. that was bad but, but I can understand a little bit of legitimacy with John Fury getting involved and all the antics going back and forth mm. but when we're talking about Tommy Fury yeah. and this and indexing yourself. He did a didn't he do a TV show recently about three or four months ago when this back and forward nonsense between between Tommy and Jake Paul. Yeah, uh, and he got a little bit out of his pram there with some yeah. of the language and some of the observations sure. that he's made. And then again, I guess you know we're I, not with all due respect. To I know theories, we're not talking about Mensa candidates, are we? No, I just think what we're looking at here, right, with this Jake Paul, um, sorry, this Tommy Fury, Fury situation is. I know he keeps saying he wants to be a boxer. As an ex-boxer, I can see that there's no real appetite and no real desire there to be that. I understand he's earning a lot of money or whatever else, but listen, if you want to go down that route and just do the entertainment value and your little, you know, bit of playing around, great. But don't. But you can't. Say you can't. You, but if you want to set, you can't for two reasons. You can't because it lacks integrity. Maybe you should come out to the theme tune from Joe Boxer. Do you remember that Joe yeah. Boxer song? So you want to be a boxer? Yeah, yeah. Like that one, In a golden right. ring. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but I suppose if you want the lure of looking like. Jake Paul is going to fight a legitimate fighter, yeah. you know, because we all keep arguing about the fact yeah. he's fighting guys that are, you know, MMA MMA guys, fifty years of age, and maybe yeah, he's yeah, moving through right. the ranks, but we haven't got a yeah. real one here. Um, are they know. just build, are they just building the profile of this fight so that they get? And sell it. I mean, that, and monetize and it, and that might be a genius yeah. move that they're actually doing because look, we're talking about it, yeah. you know, so people are talking about. Right, it. Well, let's stop them because I don't want to talk about it anymore. Right, can we move on? Okay. All right, all right. Now we've let's done our three subjects for the week. Okay, first question, Spence. Yep. Ed asks. Who are you backing in the rematch of Josh Taylor versus Jack Cattrall? Well, this is where I'm at with it. You can only, what well, to win the fight, who am I backing to win the fight? You can only go with Jack Obviously. Cattrall on, 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 on previous performance. I mean, if you look at the fight, that wasn't a f close fight. Yeah. That was a that was a one sided fight where he you know he had Taylor down and mm. admittedly Taylor was boxing well below par because yeah. Taylor is a great fighter and I'm taking nothing away from him and this is not a personal um, dig at, at Taylor but there was only one winner in that fight so yeah. you go off recent performances you know or, or off the last performances and, and you've got to go you got to go Catchell you got to think that Catchell's got his number because he dominated that. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm going to sit slightly in the middle and do what you do, which is sit on the fence sometimes, because I don't feel that I would want to be for either one of them. I think the injustice of the you fight. You mean what I do? Sit on the fence, prevaricate, when? pontificate, when? postulate, not come when? up with an answer. Well, we did it a moment ago when we were talking well, about. I'll be the first about time. About I mean, people no, being no, no, Spence, you are one of those. You know, the other day I was, I was asking people something. People being commending me for my my honesty. Offer. People are, you know, people say that I'm one of the only ones out there okay. that gives an opinion. All right, that's All right. That's, that's 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 an opinion. Okay. Um, it's not the opinion that I have. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm in the camp of thinking that I'm hoping for a much better. I, I'm a huge Joss Taylor fan. I am. I think that he was so poorly treated by British broadcasters when he fought great fights and got no. No disgusting. Um, uh, yeah, focus no, on him. Yeah, they and got, I think he felt a bit aggrieved, and he put in performances that were absolutely outstanding. Now, this performance against Jack Cattrall yeah. wasn't good enough, and he knows that. And it's not his fault that the referees scored, uh, the judges scored it the way they no, did. No, totally agree. Uh, he could have been a bit more magnanimous yeah. about who won the fight, but then he's a fighter. You know, you know that better than anybody Listen, else. if you get, if you get, if like. In reality, you should have turned around and went, you know what, the boxing gods were with me, and I felt it was close, but I think yeah. the fight... I think that he dealt with it maybe bit, wrong, a bit but... more elegant, yeah. Yeah, but, but he's a very confident, strong lad, and mm. I, I think he's an outstanding talent. We were talking about at one point, I agree. Know, getting into the pound-for-pound pound discussion, wasn't we? Yeah. Um, but I also think that Jack Cattrall was incredibly hard done by. So what I'm hoping for is that it's a really, really good fight, mm. and that the person that actually wins this fight yeah. gets the right outcome. So yeah. if Jack Cattrall goes into the ring and does yeah. precisely what he did in the first fight, which I'm not sure he can, because I yeah. think Josh Taylor is wise now. There is an element of doubt there. And, I, and, I get that's that. the unfairness of, of it. Because of how good yeah. Taylor is. And it's like yeah. boxing's one of those sports that, it, you know, it, it, it can be brutal. If you box below yeah. par, it can be brutal. Yeah. And, and and that happened to Josh Taylor. Like you say, like, that was... I've never seen Josh box 
as bad as that. That's taking nothing away from Catchell's performance because he may have done that and it made him made it, may have made him look that bad. But I've got to go with Catchell just on on that on the how wide that fight was. But you know, taking and, and taking nothing from Taylor, he's a great fighter. I mean, I think I think what we'll see. Who do you think wins? Uh, Josh Taylor. This time, are right? you going Taylor? Yeah, I think that we will see a sort of George Groves, Carl Froch scenario where I think it was as much about Jack mm. Cattrall um, uh, being underestimated by all of us. Yeah, all of us, you included. Yeah. Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. About what he thought, what we thought Josh would do to him. Yeah. I think Josh had an off night. I think some of that off night was made by how good Jack Cattrall was. Yeah. And I think in in the Groves. Um, Froch first fight I think Carl underestimated uh, George yeah, Groves yeah I get it I and understand got, and re- of course he won the fight maybe the a luck, lack and of Howard Foster stepped in and stopped the fight early but notwithstanding yeah. that in the second fight it was a done deal lack of it? motivation going yeah. into the fight because when you think a fight's a done deal you turn up and then yeah. you know it's there it's, yeah. it's your opponent's big fight and, and yours are your one you're thinking about fights ahead so I, 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 I understand I, I, I think that this time round you will see a far more compelling Josh Taylor and I think a far more compelling... We saw things from Jack Cattrall that we didn't think that the level mm. was there. So we know we can operate at a level. Yeah. But we didn't see the best of Josh Taylor. I think we'll see the best of Josh Taylor. And I think then we'll see a fight that will probably lean towards Josh Taylor because I just think he's an outstanding champion. I don't like the manner in which he perhaps conducts himself with that a lack of humility about the result. But then again, you know, <sighs> he's a fighter and he's got a fighter's yeah. mentality. Yeah. So um, dividing opinions, that's good. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, like, listen, the, the, the question is steered towards who do you want? If you want from a, from, a, from a point of view of thinking, this kid went in uh, there when no one gave him a chance, he went yeah. into his backyard. And no, I think it's more, I think I think the qu- question is really steered to who do you think? I think that that's, Josh yeah, Taylor. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go All casual. Right. Next question, Adam asks, did you see the crowd violence clip at the Probellum event? What's the worst crowd violence you've ever seen at an event? I did, and I thought on Friday night that you know it was disgusting the way the crowd, you know crowd were in there. I think it was a local tra- uh, travelling community that were in there um, doing this, and there was punches thrown everywhere. The ring got invaded. Yeah. Thought, you know, it was stopped for five minutes or so. Yeah, it's disgusting. Do you know what? What was it? Was do you know what I saw? Do you remember going back? I think it was where was it? Nineteen ninety sometime, nineteen ninety four somewhere around then. I think. Nigel Ben was defending his WBC title against Gimenez. I think his name was Gimenez, a guy, and it was at Birmingham's NEC. Right. And on the undercard, now you'll remember this, and this will probably come flooding back to you. On the undercard, Steve Foster, who had a mad crowd come yeah, down yeah. from down from Salford, um, he boxed. Who did Steve Foster box? Oh, Rob McCracken. Steve Foster boxed Rob McCracken, who had this mad army of mm. Birmingham fans that followed him as well, and it kicked off. Man, it was bad. The barriers were going in the ring. People were getting ironed out. Every where that was a really bad one to you know um, Shall I tell you what I mean I the, the three that spring to mind for me was obviously Minter versus Hagler, Hagler yeah at Wembley Arena yeah um, when Hagler just destroyed Alan Minter yeah and uh, you know I think there were some undercurrents of people's attitude sure. towards the fact that Marvin Hagler was a black fighter and fighting in Britain at that yeah. time which I think is yeah, appalling was... um, because he was an outstanding mm. human being as well as fighter yeah I think if you look, it's a pretty negative subject because no one's really interested in what goes on uh, fighting outside the ring. But yeah. do you remember when Andrew Galotta fought? Oh my God. Yeah, that was come Riddick back Bo. to me. Riddick Bow, yeah. Big Daddy Where Riddick the phones Bo. were getting, people yeah. getting hit with and, phones. And the, and, the, and the promoter, Rock Newman, yeah. went up and smashed yeah, Galotta yeah, yeah. in the back of the head with a, with a yeah. mobile phone and all kinds of stuff. And what about Errol Christie when he boxed? Errol Christie boxed. Who did he box? Um, Errol Christie boxed. Oh, Tony Simpson. No, no, not Tony Simpson. Mark Kayla. Mark Kayla. Errol yeah. Christie yeah. box Mark Kayla. That was insane. And, yeah. that, and there was, a, there was there an was element a, of there racism was, there, there was, as yeah. well. There was, yeah. But yeah. that all kicked yeah. off really yeah. bad. Yeah. So we do see it. And I remember yeah. Herbie Hyde had that fight with Michael Bent as he well. Did, yeah. Do you remember that yeah. was all yeah. going? So look, I think there's always, you're always going to get that at boxing shows. We're going to have some, but I think that in recent times, we've been pretty good, to be fair. It's been more of a carnival. And you want it that way. Sort of there's always an underlying element. I went to but, Cardiff to watch see, yeah. see Joshua versus uh, Joseph Parker was fighting in the crowd. I saw, you know, Tyson fight um, Julius Francis, and there was that attitude. But anyway, let's move mm. on from that. Yeah. It's a little bit yeah, negative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's negative. not really what boxing's about. Paula asks, do you take Tommy Furiously serious as a boxer? No. Okay. Do you? Yeah. Do you? Well, she no, says she's sick listen, of him. Listen, I think in, in recent times, I can't take him seriously as a boxer. I think that when I, when he first turned professional, I thought, yeah, this kid's got talent. You know, he's got the DNA. He's a fury. Like, and that's going to push him on, you know, with what his brother's doing and it, it, everything else. I think, yeah, he's gonna, this kid's going to push on. But I think that 
He's other do life. Do you take him bloody seriously? He's other life or not? that he does. I'm getting there. I'm okay. getting there. The other life that he does. No, I don't take. Spence, no. no, I don't take him seriously as okay. a boxer. Not, not right now. All right. Here's a, another question. We seem to be in influencer territory. You know Andrew Tate? Yes. So yeah. he was he a former kickboxer or something. He did, or so, yeah. Done sort of combat. Yeah. Smart kid. Not as smart as he thinks he is, but smart. Right? Very controversial. Uh, very big influence to say some rather silly things, but he's yeah. got this enormous following. I yeah. mean, he thinks he's the most famous person in the world. I think yeah. he's bumped his head on the way out yeah. somewhere. But well, above you. Good point. Well made. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, um, but there's a, there's a, there is an indication that he's going to fight... Jake Paul. I saw right. it at ringside. This at, is a at money this, fight. This is two influencers this got yeah. huge followings. Now. I'm going show, to tell yeah. you what this is. There's some gravy in this. Yeah. What do you think to that? I, I'd stick it in that entertainment bracket. Why do we don't get this pull it into the boxing like world? But although they, although they're using boxing as a as the um, what's the word I'm looking for? Come on, you're great with words. They're using boxing as the conduit, the foundation rapper, the gateway, of this, yeah. the foundation of this. Yeah. It's not, you know, it's, it's what it is. It's like, yeah, it goes down to the entertainment value. I think they'll get, you know, they're massive numbers. They're going to do it because financially it's going to be great. Mm. But unfortunately, they, that's what the word I was looking for. They're using boxing as the umbrella. That's what they're doing. All right, well, to protect themselves against something. No. <laughs> they're using boxing as the umbrella. Like, boxing's obviously the the, right. the, the the forefront of it all, but it's entertainment. It's not real. It's not real boxing. Yeah, I mean, it goes to the part, point that we are talking about earlier on the show about influencers. Andrew Tate, he's a bright kid. I saw him interviewed on Piers Morgan, and, you know, yeah. it's a challenge in itself, isn't it, to try and get oh, with Piers, yeah. king of the narcissists. But the bottom line is, <laughs> is that, uh, you know, Andrew Tate and Jake Paul, for me, is just a sideshow. Yeah. It's a not, you know, if you want to watch it's, that, fine. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it is. I'm and there'll be millions that do. Right, that's it for episode six of Talk Boxing with myself and Spencer Oliver. Now, of course, don't forget to keep liking and subscribing, but equally as importantly, leaving those brilliant questions in the comment section below, and we'll look forward to seeing you next week.